really two-way opportunity terms and in terms of political cooperation. Thank you very much. <laughs> you won't let you go that easily, right? <laughs> Okay, we'll start with Surain, maybe, uh, and I'll give you the space, yeah. Thanks, John, that was great. Um, just a question on um, the, the whole GFC. Um, banks are too big to fail, so governments rescued many banks around the world. Um, governments themselves got themselves into a problem with the sovereign debt crisis, so central banks now are basically bailing out these sovereigns. Um, they have not as yet replaced the uh, glass steagall type legislation because Frank Dodds hasn't done much uh, in that regard. Where does it all end with the amount of debt and derivatives that are all circulating around the world? Well, it's a, it's a very important question because I, I think one of my disappointments in the period since the GFC was in the first week of the GFC everybody was calling for all sorts of dramatic reform of the financial system. And, um, uh, and um, you know, we're going to all sorts of uh, coordinated responses and new policies and new structures and, and very little of that has actually happened, partly because it's been trying to decide those sort of issues through either the IMF or you know, the G20 or something like that. There are not forums where you can actually make substantive decisions quickly, as I said before. Um, I don't know, a lot of it's just education as to what the nature of the problem really is. See, I mentioned that we got, I got nervous in the middle of 2007 about debt instruments, okay? And I'll use a specific example. I looked by chance at my local council's annual report. And you know, you've got to be suffering from severe insomnia to be bothered picking up your local council's annual report and reading it, particularly reading the finance section. But I found that they had nearly $60 million worth of trust money, you know? investment funds, and they'd given them all to this place called Lehman Brothers, Grange Securities, to manage. And so I just wrote an article on the local paper saying how insane it was to put all your money in one basket. Why wouldn't you have had six lots of ten or twenty lots of five, you know, whatever, um, twelve, <coughs> excuse me, twelve lots of five or whatever to make and spread your risk. And they'd done it for a very small margin relative to a Westpac bank deposit rate. And then I said, well, I looked at where they put this money, and they put more than 50% of it in, L, in, in, in uh, CDOs, collateralised debt obligations. And I said, oh, Christ. So I drew attention to that too and said, there are two mistakes now. You know, given it all to one to manage and two, you put it in CDOs. Well, I got slammed by everybody in the council to say they didn't understand. But these are AAA rated securities, <laughs> and if you hold them to maturity, we'll get our money back. So I had to write another article which said, well, they ain't AAA, actually. There's a little tranche that's AAA. The rest of them go all the way down to junk status. And um, don't worry, you won't get a chance to hold them to maturity. <laughs> It'll implode beforehand. But as a result, I started to look at some of these structures. And the way that the financial system had been allowed to run free and underprice risk, I mean, subprime loans, to get a subprime loan in the United States, you had to be a demonstrated financial delinquent. You had to be a bankrupt or missed your payments and so on. Then they'd lend you as much as 125% of the value of a house you know, on a no recourse lending basis and back the keys if you can't pay me on an artificially high interest rate to start. And you say to yourself, well, what's that? That is a punt on house prices continuing to rise because ultimately they'll be able to re, you know, earn a bit of equity, reset the loan and go on. And you know, post-war period, post-war, post-depression period, basically, house prices have fairly consistently risen, with one, with one exception. There was a reasonable pump, people said, except it was insane. And on top of that, you securitise those, and then you another know layer of securitisation, another debt instruments, house of debt, credit default swaps, whatever. And um, I don't think, you know, I sit on this trilateral commission. We've got people on there like Paul Volcker, who's argued a lot of these changes. We don't think the world understands how much of a mistake they made and who carries responsibility for the underpricing of that risk. And, um, you know, look at the rating agencies. They've got away with those ratings at AAA. 
uh, can't be sued in the United States, but fortunately they are being sued elsewhere. So I, don't, I think the first place to start is to educate people as to the magnitude of the problem. Shit, central banks got caught short. And now we hear in Australia how clever our banks were. Yeah, they weren't involved. Give them another year, they would have all been involved, right up to their ears, because that's what bankers do. You know, we are just lucky in this country, I think, and uh, we, our, I, I wouldn't put absolute faith in our prudential supervision, as I wouldn't put absolute faith in the changes that have been made. There have been changes made in the US, but, you know, one of Obama's biggest problems was he bailed out Wall Street, got $800 million worth of bailout, $800 billion worth of bailout, uh, and uh, burnt off most of Main Street as a, in paying for it. So I think we have a long way to go to get people to understand the nature of the risk, and then when you get understand that risk, then you can start to put in place structures that will manage it. It's not just going to be a matter of, you know, you've got to carry more capital. Because all that does is, is actually start to cripple the, the pace of recovery. <coughs> Next question is from Roman. Uh, Dr. Houston, thank you so much for <coughs> an enlightening session. I just uh, got a um, query. Earlier you mentioned uh, some economic uncertainty prevailing around Chinese market, Europe, uh, the US. A uh, few, few years ago, we have a GFC as well, which had a severe impact. As a result, I view it as an over-regulation of the market. So wherever you see, you see so many regulations, so many, even if you look at these uh, ball three coming in place next year. So it's effectively going to reduce the capital inflow in the whole economic world, world's economic system. Well, that was the point I just made. I don't think it's just necessarily an answer of asking for more capital. So you know, more capital, if you still can't manage the risk or understand the risk, doesn't make much difference. So it just takes a bit longer to lose the money, that's all. So even in Australian markets, so we are, we are seeing losing productivity across all, all sectors, and again, banks are working under severe economic pressures with falling market markets as well. So does it mean the over-regulation is the, is the answer, or should we go again back to the free flow of regulations? Well, I'm, I'm very sceptical about, uh, about regulation. I mean, I did my PhD thesis on this thing called the Euro currency market and explaining how come you could actually have dollars, euro dollars, uh, traded offshore to the United States. And, um, you know, uh, that came from regulation of the US market. It came from a system of exchange and capital controls which sought to keep transactions onshore, but actually drove transactions offshore. And, uh, and um, regulation of the euro markets was not the answer. In fact, it was impossible. But deregulation of the US market was the answer because it created a lesser incentive to move these transactions offshore. You know, they used to say, you go to New York and get a loan for a million dollars. I said, we can only do 800,000. We go to London, we give you the other two out of our London office. You know, these, these sort of regulations do not work. The same as in Australia when we had a heavily regulated banking system. You know, when I came back to Australia in the middle 70s, uh, we were a very insular, inward-looking country with a heavily regulated banking system. And we used to have interest rates and exchange rates set by politicians. We used to sit in the cabinet room and Malcolm Fraser and his team would say whether interest rates should go up or down or whether the currency should go up or down. There's a classic couple of stories there, but, you know, the Monetary Policy Committee of Cabinet consisted of seven people, and the first four of those people were farmers. You're Malcolm, you Doug Anthony, um, Ian Sinclair, Tony Street. So it didn't matter what the other three thought. It was what farmers thought was good for them. So farmers always thought the dollar should be low, interest rates should be low. A bit inconsistent, but they basically asked for what they wanted. And so they would, so could never, we'd have all these exchange rate crises with a fixed exchange rate. They wouldn't know how to set the new exchange rate. Now, we don't want to go back to that sort of, that sort of world and that sort of thinking. It's only just one specific example. In 1976, there's a massive devaluation of the Australian currency, 17.5%. And uh, at the time, Treasury reluctantly had recommended 7.5% devaluation. And the way that decision was taken was Fraser said to the Secretary of the Treasury, will 7.5% devaluation stop the capital outflow? And they weren't sure. He said, well, 10% stop the capital outflow. They still weren't sure. What about 12.5%? After a fair bit of discussion, they still weren't sure. Well, what about 17.5%? Oh, shit, that'll stop it. Done. <laughs> that's how that decision was taken. Now, that's the mentality that you get when you go back to a regulatory world. You allow people to sit at the top of Martin Place or down in the cabinet room here or 
New York or the equivalent, making decisions they shouldn't make. But having said that, to make the market work, you've got to have a regulatory structure around it that sets standards, that sets you know, acceptable standards in terms of accounting and behaviour and, and transactions. Where, so you can't, you've got to get that balance. And what usually happens, you get, you know, like Glass Steel Act came in the, in the 30s because they just said, oh, no, we've got to separate commercial banks from investment banks. In the early part of their last, <coughs> last decade, they changed that. And then people feel that's underwritten what's happened in terms of the GFC, so now to go back and reinstate something like a Glass-Siegel Act in the US again. Where's the thinking there, the understanding of what's behind that, the nature of risk? And people don't understand risk. And right now I mentioned climate change. Governments are underpricing climate risk. Funds are underpricing climate risk. You know, asset owners are underpricing climate risk. And it won't happen until one day there is a climate catastrophe and everyone's going to say, oh, you know, we've lost all this money. And I think a climate catastrophe will translate to a financial catastrophe. It will drive stock markets down, losses of asset values. You watch. That's why it's important to do something about it. So. Yeah. Next question. Thank you for inviting me. <coughs> uh, as economist, uh, do you think there is a correlation between high in, in income tax rate and low productivity in Australia? So I didn't hear the question. Uh, as economist, I just had a question. Is there is a, any correlation between higher income tax rates and low productivity in, in Australia? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think there is a relationship between high tax rates and low productivity. The difficulty is how you get lower tax rates. And, and you know, it's not the only reason why we have low productivity. We, we have gone backwards in the last five or ten years, maybe fifteen years, in terms of the reform process as a whole, where we were opening up markets in, domestically. I mean, we, we deregulated the financial system and opened up the financial markets to global pressures, we allowed the exchange rate to float, we allowed currencies, so interest rates to be determined in market circumstances. We broke down the centralised wage determination system, worked pretty much towards enterprise bargaining, abolished tariff protection and so on. They were all key elements. We had a boom in productivity in the 90s, an absolute boom. And since the middle 90s, all those things have gone backwards. People are looking how to re-regulate banks one way or another, either by stealth or moral suasion through the bank. They're looking at how to look for protection in another form. If you can't get it in, in a tariff, get it in some other form. Use uh, you know, quarantine restrictions, use whatever. Industrial relations has gone back to, swung back in favour of more centralised determination, more industrial power to the union movement. You know, we've undone a lot of what was done. Part of that is tax, and tax has just not been reformed. We haven't had the reform of tax we could have had. One of the things that fascinated me with the GST debate when Howard introduced the GST was the Treasury put a condition on it that none of the revenue from GST could be used to lower personal or corporate tax. Not, does not compute. That is not insane. Why would you do that? We're going to have tax reform debates now. We had Henry. We just had another tax summit. The constraint on both of them is you can't change the GST rate. The only way you're going to create the circumstances in this country now to lower personal and, and, uh, and uh, corporate tax in a way that will stimulate productivity is to broaden the GST and increase its rate and abolish all the inefficient taxes that cause you problems. Stamp duties, you know, um, 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 payroll taxes, a whole host of bits and pieces that there shouldn't be there, and lower the rates and give people a chance to earn and you know, keep a larger percentage of what they earn. Pay more on expenditure, yes, but, you know, okay, there's all sorts of issues going to be raised by that. I lost an election trying to win that argument. But it's still the case, 21 years after I announced that package, uh, as of yesterday, I think, that uh, you know, we haven't learned that lesson. And you can stimulate productivity dramatically if you improve the tax system as much as you go back and keep reforming the areas where you know, we were making substantial progress. And the tragedy in political terms, we had bipartisan support from the late 70s to the early 90s for all those sort of changes. Now we'll disagree about anything. The only thing we agree about is being in the war in Afghanistan where we shouldn't be. <laughs> it's the only place we've got bipartisan support. It's insane. 
and I think that one question. Um, Dr. Eason, <clears throat> you can't ask well, me a question. You got I, me to come here. No, I know. <laughs> this, uh, <coughs> we have our title, Dynamic Global Changes the World of Opportunities. And I want to really draw your attention on that. So we are talking about opportunity here. I know you said that you're pessimistic about all these things. But there is an opportunity. I, I see the deflation in asset prices all over the world. And that could be considered like a redistribution of the wealth for the people who could not afford before. How we can really convert this whole situation into really opportunity? Well, individually or countries? Uh, as or a country, as a society, as a region. Well, one of the problems with, uh, with global growth going into a much lower phase, if you take a very simple view of the last several decades, the, the world enjoyed a growth rate at a certain level essentially on the back of debt of a certain level. When you lower that debt, you're going to lower your capacity to have that growth. Right? So we are going into a world, and, and in, in a, I should say in those decades, we did start to make substantial progress globally against you know, poverty, for example, and uh, low education standards. Low, you, you know, all those measures are in the Millennium Development Goals. We were making progress on all fronts, but they were, the progress was actually unsustainable because it was debt-based rather than and poorly managed debt based. <clears throat> so as you go into a world of lower growth, you're going to find it harder to deal with issues like poverty and uh, inequality and uh, inadequacy of education and so on. It becomes that much more, more difficult. But that should encourage people to think about other ways in which you can deliver, deliver these changes. And you know, technology is often a very good answer to a lot of this. One of the things that you find hard in our world is people thinking about the technological solution to a problem. We've just had, for example, in education, a review of schools called the Gonski Report. Right? Now, Gonski is looking at how we make what we've got today better. It's not looking out 25 years to say with technology and so on, how are we going to have to change the education system dramatically? Universities still pride themselves on the number of new buildings they're adding, when in fact you may not need buildings at all. You know, this, is, this thinking has not taken place. And that's where technology, when, when growth is slow, the way to boost growth again is a technological solution. We've always heard over hundreds and hundreds of years that with limits to growth, the limits to pro the capacity of the world to absorb population and so on. It's technology that's managed to offset all of that. And, and allowed us to continue to grow and to continue to populate and so on. And so I think technology is where the focus ought to be. And that says when you come back to countries, you should be spending a lot more on education system, uh, money in education, <coughs> but not necessarily just jacking up what you've got, thinking about where you've got to be in the next 20, 25 years. So I think there are opportunities in every area. And just, you know, th there are opportunities even when people get into trouble with debt, as you know. We've been talking about one or two of them. You can buy those assets back off the bank at a lower price and actually make the quid that the other person didn't make. That's an opportunity. So there's opportunities out of the, you know, the bottom end at an individual level or at a society level at the top. And I think personally technology is an important part of that. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hewson. Just a minute more. <laughs> uh, Request uh, uh, Mr. Rahul JT from uh, Bank of Queensland, Bella Vista. He's a owner manager there, and uh, Bank of Queensland, Bella Vista are our gold sponsors. Uh, request him to give away a token of appreciation for Dr. John Hewson. I feel like an Olympic champion. <laughs> Uh, Rahulji, do you want to do the lucky draw as well? See, I didn't forget. Uh, uh, I'll get Yudhinder uh, Gupta to come up on the stage. I won't bother. Okay. Uh, and uh, Shantanu too. Yep. Uh, request uh, Shantanu and Yatinder Gupta to be on stage, please, for the lucky draw. To get the prize. No. <laughs> Yatinder has this, uh, has this uh, uncanny or a knack to somehow get these lucky prizes. We just got to ensure he doesn't get one. <laughs> no, I think the founder, the chairman, and the chairman are actually not entitled for this. You know, those. Uh, okay. Oh, <laughs> just, right. just, just for oh, the sake of it. No, no, I'm just joking. I recently anyway. took a mortgage, so I'm not going to afford another one. <laughs> just, just have one. And you too. Absolutely. Yeah, you can do that. Hundred and fifty dollars. 
Okay, this is uh, the $150 Maya voucher for David Muller. David? Oh, he's a guy. Oh, he's a guy. Which one is David? Yeah. Oh, no, it's David Muller. It is me. Oh. <laughs> oh no 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 David David mate it's you I think it's you yeah. it's 77 oh, million. No, just, no, no, no. just, just uh, that bit. Uh, I don't want to give away the address but are you from Liverpool no who's from Liverpool yeah that's that's <laughs> I don't know what's happening <laughs> okay the next one is uh, Shabnam. Uh, Shabnam I think there should be only one Shabnam in, in okay. Yeah. 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 Come, come on. Come this way. Come this way. I'll take the other one. Alright. That guy. Just just all no, no, he's already come. He's already come. Oh, yeah. Thank bad you. luck. Thank you. Thank you. Please come. Go, go, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for you. Thank you. Thank Merry you. Christmas. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This one to goes twice a year. Uh, we can talk about it later. Uh, so, we had one more actually lucky draw. Mr. Das uh, Naya, if you can come over on behalf of Sumo Global. Can we get the chairman and the pastor? Oh, come back, come back, come back again. Oh, again. Okay. Let's do that. I can't keep on excluding me. <laughs> come on stage, man. Come on stage. Yeah. Well, I'll try to get somebody else this time. <laughs> oh, yeah. What do we do if it's the same person? <laughs> well, it's the same, isn't it? So, Suresh Warrior. Suresh, are you still around? Yeah. So, sorry, this Suresh one was for 75 for. Yep, so. Yep, $75 voucher goes to Suresh Warrior. And is Ganesh Kamath here? He's left, so we'll have to do another draw, mate. We can't give it away. Uh, so I'll do that. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't want to take responsibility for $125 voucher. My wife will spend it. We know them, Lani. This way. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Tasnaya from Sumo Global. Uh, okay, so if you think we are going to conclude uh, this uh, conference now, um, just in for a, we are all in for a surprise because I was telling you in the morning that we have an Indian delegation who has come all the way from India for this conference. Uh, it's been led by uh, Mr. Lalit Mohan, uh, IFS. Uh, and what, what we thought is that he, he's been doing some really amazing work in uh, a state called Himachal Pradesh in India. And we thought if he could just for five minutes share his experiences with you, I think it will be a major eye opener. So his topic, his topic is promotion of business of handicrafts and handloom products. And I'm just going to read his profile out, which he just sent to me today morning. So Dr. Lalit Mohan is an officer of the All India Service. He's been working in different positions in um, government service since 1983. And last, he was as an additional principal chief conservative, conservator of forest. His 15 years work on wildlife con conservation was recognized by World Peace and Association of UK. And he has presented his work in UK, China, Austria, and Germany. You must just be wondering, what is that wildlife con conservation to do with handicrafts and handlooms. So this is where it gets interesting. He was posted as a managing director of Himachal Pradesh State Handicraft and Handloom Corporation in 2009, where he did excellent work and revived the organization from red to profit in 2011. Seeing his performance, the government gave him additional charge of Chief Executive Officer of Himachal Pradesh State Khadi and Village Industry Board during uh, in November Oh, sorry, in November 2011, where again uh, he uh, so he increased uh, the productivity more than 45% over there, and uh, 
the, the main thing which I kind of really found it appealing was that he's improved the livelihood of poor weavers and artisans who are involved in the production of handicrafts and handloom items in the state. So please welcome Dr. Lalit Mohan, uh, IAS from the Himachal Pradesh uh, Khadi and Handloom Board. Very good afternoon to everyone, and thank you, Mr. Gupta, and you all too, for pro providing me this opportunity to share my experience with you. Uh, the purpose of the visit is already told to you to promote the business of the handicraft and handloom products of the Himachal Pradesh, which is one of the state of the India. We are mainly dealing with the handmade. I want to stress again, it is only the handmade products which we are producing in Himachal Pradesh. And the products are likely the, like shawls, stoles, mufflers, scarf, shocks, and the metal craft and wood craft also. We are dealing mainly in the handloom products and less in handicraft products. This organization was established in the year 1974. You were surprised that I am a wildlifer. I have given this opportunity to work in a corporate sector. It is, it is really a challenge to me also. But in the government organization, we can be posted anywhere. Anyway, when I studied this organization, I found that there were so many problems. It was so complex, I was unable to understand what to do. Then we realized that let us improve, because it was in deficit since long, many years, 1974, and there was no financial support for any government, rather state government, as well as from the government of India. Then we analyzed that there is a need to improve the first to the financial position of the organization. And we found that till we have the sustainability of the organization, we cannot work. Because finance is very important role, and you play a very important role in any organization. So what I did, the skill generation, skill generation of the poor weavers and the artisans who are producing these products in the state. And we focused on marketing, because marketing was very poor in this organization before me. And then we diversified the products. We modified the products as per the market demand. We studied the market demand uh, market in different places in the country and abroad also. We found that the, the, the uh, reasons that why we are not able to sell our product because of the market demand. What we were producing in my area in Shimla, we were not able to sell in Delhi because the requirement is di different. Colors are different, patterns are different, designs are different. Similarly, in your area in Australia, the design is different, colors are different. Likely in New York, we went to New York also, and accordingly we modified. We, we uh, engaged the designers in, in this organization, and accordingly we did some work. Then we organized the exhibition, which is one of the area where we can sell our product. And we focus more to organize many exhibitions, as many as possible in India, as well as out of India. We launched a new scheme, which is known as minimum sale guarantee. It's a new scheme. What we did, it's simple. Just we outsource our some of the emporium in the country to the private people who were involved in production of the handicraft products. So indirectly, the artisans and the weavers, they were benefited. And I want to give some of the figures which I have. When I joined in 2009, there were liabilities of roughly $2 million. It's a small organization. So liability means the staffs to be paid $2 million as a salary, which was not given, as other wages, like traveling expenses, 